good morning everyone a very warm welcome to all the speakers delegates present over here for this session energy positive smart buildings and campuses at india smart utility week 2024 in collaboration with usaid sarep now i would request mr reji kumar pillai president india smart grid forum for the welcome address welcome sir Good morning and a very warm welcome to all the speakers and uh, participants of this session. And really delighted to um, see Anand Kumar sir, who used to be Secretary of MNRE, and we worked very closely those days. And, and also happy that somebody who worked in the power sector, heading the real estate uh, uh, regulatory authority in Delhi, where so much of uh, real estate development is happening. One of the uh, main reason for this session or the, or the context of the session itself is that um, half the electricity generated is consumed in buildings. And any efficiency which we can bring in buildings is going to lead to energy savings. And in the past, we never bothered about uh, who uses how much electricity. We encourage people to consume more so that the utility get more money provided they have surplus. So that era is changing. And some numbers which I hear globally is that uh, today a building can be, e even in a uh, what you call tropical climate where 300 days you need air conditioning, a building can be built with today's materials and technology where power consumption can be in the range of 50 to 60 kilowatt hour per year per meter square. But average buildings built in India are all 200 plus. So how can we do? We have several courts, uh, building courts available, but nowhere we are saying that the energy consumption should be less than 100. We should at least start with 100. We will not approve buildings if your annual energy consumption is more than 100 kilowatt hour per square meter per year. Some standard like that we should set, which no, nobody is talking about it. And number two, the other side, uh, other room, we just started parallelly running another one on district cooling systems. So we are convinced that district cooling systems is the future because today only 10% of the households have access to cooling. I mean, a room air conditioner which they have. And suppose 50% households have air conditioning, our peak demand of 230 megawatt, gigawatt will become double. <laughs> it is going to be the biggest thing. And uh, I was just at the other opening of that session, I was telling in 1981 when I came to Delhi, the temperature in Delhi was 42 degrees centigrade. It was unbearable because I came from Kerala. Kerala, it was 32, 33 degree. And that 42 degree now has gone to close to 50. In, in 2022 20, summer, highest temperature in Delhi was 49.3 degree. By end of the decade, it will be more than 50, well above 50, which will be very difficult for people to uh, commute during the day, sleep during the night. Those who are in Delhi, who in the old days in the 90s and 80s and all that, you remember before Delhi electricity was, distribution was privatized. Most of the days, even if you have a cooler, it will not work because there's no electricity. I'm Terrasme Jackson, <laughs> so they, so, and sleep deprived day the follow, uh, follows. Now with the low income category people without access to cooling, is becoming sleep deprived. They are the people who are driving us. They are the people who are doing most of the work around in buildings, in the road, everywhere. So as a society, we have a moral uh, obligation to give cooling to them for at least sleeping six, seven hours a night. How, how can it be done? We cannot create new buildings and uh, give it to them, but we can, with, with district cooling systems where Cooling is given as a service against a monthly fee, like electricity, water, gas, etc. These are all you against a monthly fee you are giving. So we could today there is a, a, a subsidy for electricity for poor people. So the same way in DCS we may be able to come out with regulation. The low income communities will be given cooling as a service against a subsidized fee monthly fee. So we happen to visit sometime in 2019 the DCS which is built in Gift City in Gujarat. Gift City was the first DCS, functional modern DCS in the country. 
we have seen that the electricity consumption there is almost one third of what could have been if all, each of the building had their own centralized air conditioning system. This has been able to bring electricity consumption. So we applied the same metrics to aerocity and calculated. And aerocity today consumes something like 230, 240 megawatt of electricity and 60, 70 percent of it goes in cooling. And had there been one single DCS, it could have been 50, 60 megawatt. And the entire electricity distribution grid of aerocity would have been one third of its size. And, and the biggest attraction for it, why we when visited uh, the Gift City DCS and several other DCS thereafter in Middle East and other places, is because DCS is built with thermal energy storage. When there is surplus electricity in the night or during the day, surplus electricity, you make chilled water. At the, the one in um, Gift City is 4 degrees centigrade, they make chilled water and store it in an insulated tank. And the evening peak hour, the buildings, uh, the, the centralized chiller plant is shut, but the chilled water which is in the insulated tank is supplied to the buildings for cooling. Three, four hours it can run easily. So it's a load relief for the electricity grid and also a load during surplus generation on the grid. In India, both northern and western grid are surplus generation during the afternoon, most of the days, at least 300 days in a year, we have surplus generation during afternoons, high solar generation hours. So uh, with clean energy, actually, you, you can give cooling. Uh, surplus solar energy on the grid can be given at concessional rate to DCS systems, which can generate uh, chilled water and give a load relief to the distribution grid in the evening that brings in flexibility. Similarly, the electric vehicles which have taken off in a big way, we we had written another white, so on, on the DCS part into 2020, we had written a white paper saying that this is the need of the hour, one, for providing cooling, and number two, uh, giving flexibility for the electricity distribution grid. And we worked with the, uh, uh, Bureau of Energy Efficiency, so who was in charge of India Cooling Action Plan. The original document version 1 of Cooling Action Plan didn't have DCS in it. So after we have a white paper and our couple of rounds of meeting, they revised that and DCS is a central piece of today India Cooling Action Plan. And they also appointed a, a, a committee to prepare guidelines for DCS. That's a very fine document which was released at Clean Energy Ministerial last year. So very detailed guidelines which we got it prepared. And it was, they were helped by GIC and uh, AEEE. So they prepared that. It's a very good document. And there are a wider committee which uh, re reviewed it and given recommendations. So now there has to be a regulation. Regulation that any new buildings with, or big complexes, you can say, uh, multi-storied building or a big campuses where our electricity consumption is in megawatt, the, instead of going for centralized air conditioning, it should be a, a shared between different buildings. And <coughs> these guidelines cover both greenfield projects as well as brownfield projects. Today there are about, in last four years, we have made so much of progress, there are 50 to 70 buildings are under, or campuses are under construction with DCS. Unfortunately, couldn't do it for the um, a new parliament and a central vista project we had returned to them uh, in 2020 but by the time our letter reached there the design was final and they have already gone ahead with uh, having centralized air conditioning in each of them but the main question comes about the regulation who is going to set the regulations and who is going to set the tariff and uh, if you make it mandatory and who is going to regulate that sector is a, one of the main question mark today. So m our recommendation is that till such time, you take the case of electricity, you have a separate regulatory commission in every state, but you take the case of PNGRB, just one regulator for the entire country. And we are doing gas, city gas distribution. Today, almost 70% of the country licenses have been issued. We can have one regulator for DCS, for a cooling regulator for the country, or till such time that is not there, we can, the agency which is maximum impacted by air conditioning load is electricity distribution companies. So that responsibility can be assumed by electricity, state electricity regulatory commissions. We have to bring in regulations to do that. And this is on the DCS side. On the other side, electrical load for the EV charging is also increasing. Maybe 
it's not going to be a major issue from the energy perspective, but from the power perspective, peak load perspective, it's going to be a ma major load during peak hours. So we have been, and there are technologies in many places, but again, regulations lacking. Uh, we can do vehicle to grid technology where morning you come to office, your car is going to be idle. In fact, most of the cars are 22 hours, it's idle. 22 hours, it's sitting some real estate where you pay parking charge or you already paid big money for buying that area where a car is kept. Two hours only, most of your cars run. So this is a huge, uh, uh, when, when those vehicles are going to become electric, the battery capacity of that millions of vehicles, that's the best way where electricity can be stored and called back for supporting the grid. So the, the, the V2G, the vehicle to grid technology, which has been widely tested in many places are basically DC V2G because you have to send a signal to the car to charge or discharge. That communication is there only in DC charging, AC charging is a dumb charging, used to be. But there are places where AC charging is also being done. We are convinced, we studied this for the last four or five years and we are convinced that AC V2G is the one which is good for us. And we just started a project uh, last month uh, with technical collaboration with the U University of Delaware. And we will be doing four vehicles. Madam, you approved our loan, but the, uh, sorry, our SAREP grant two years ago, but the project didn't come because MOP said it is very futuristic. <laughs> so it didn't happen that time, but we got another small grant from Shakti Foundation and we started. So in Delhi, we'll have three vehicles in each of the three private discoms, uh, BYPL, BRPL, and uh, TPDDL three in Tata Nexon and uh, Mr. Jodilal from Kerala, he is very excited about this. He wants to have, be part of the thing. So he is also giving a, their own K KCB vehicle, which will convert it. So what we are going to do, we are going to convert this existing EV with a bi-directional AC-DC converter on the vehicle. And then we'll have a bi-directional AC charger on the ground. And we'll be testing when you give a control uh, signal, it will charge, it will discharge, which will be based on the transformer load. And in case of, uh, BRPL and TPDDL will be able to connect it to their distribution management system, so which will uh, give commands when it can be. So look at a future building where you have rooftop solar, and 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 you have a, a, the V2G capable vehicles which are plugged onto the building. Uh, it can be residential, it can be uh, uh, commercial buildings, so, and when we are going to have a time of use tariff or a TOD tariff, evening peak when there is going to be uh, a higher price for the electricity. Today, most of us pay flat tariff, but when it is going to be a, a, a peak hour, you are paying higher price. Uh, such smart buildings can actually switch uh, island from the main grid. The car battery plus, uh, and many buildings are sir, another most important thing I wanted to uh, appeal to you is stop build, having buildings with a DG set. So we have about 80,000 megawatt of DG set used in big buildings across the country as for standby power. And many places even now there are power cut, they need some, but the battery prices are coming down so low that uh, we can replace those DG set with a, uh, uh, Two minutes. Uh, sir is first time coming to this program, so I just wanted him to, and he used to go and regulate, uh, uh, regulate these bu new buildings which are coming. DG said stop them, uh, have battery energy storage, and promote uh, vehicle to grid technology uh, in buildings. So in one of our uh, uh, earlier paper, we had written that all new buildings and campuses should have at least 20% of the parking space with uh, uh, EV charging facility which is not there. But the, uh, uh, MAUA has issued a regulation through uh, TCPO, Town and Country Planning Organization, all new campuses should have EV charging and 20% of the parking space. No compliance, no, it's not being complied. So all the new development which comes to RERA for approval, please put these two, three things. One, DCS wherever possible. Two, no DG set, it has to be battery energy storage system. And um, the V2G guidelines. With this, uh, I hand over to the panel. <laughs> Please, thank you very much.
Thank you, sir, for the insightful welcome address. Now, I would request Ms. Apurva Chaturvedi, Senior Clean Energy Specialist, Indo-Pacific Office, USAID, India, to give welcome address and contest setting presentation. Welcome, ma'am. Uh, thank you to ISGF uh, uh, for organizing this every year. Uh, glad to be here amongst all of you, and uh, good morning to everyone. Uh, is somebody going to run the presentation? Or is it, is it, because I don't see it loaded here. So I think Reggie has already said the contours, uh, has made my job very easy, and perhaps the panelist's job also very easy, so we'll restrict ourselves to bare minimum in the interest of time. Uh, let me. So basically, uh, the whole idea about net zero positive buildings uh, as, as a last mile uh, element of a smart grid, as we call it, this was uh, seeded uh, as a thought, as a, as a concept, around three years back under our previous bilateral program, METRI. And the whole idea was you know, traditionally, USAID has a long history of working in the green building sector, brought out the concept of green building for the first time with the CII Green Building Council uh, uh, set up in Hyderabad, their building, and then, you know, establishing, supporting the establishment of IGBC and so on and so forth. So from the green buildings to the building code, energy conservation building code, to large-scale projects on energy efficiency through ESL, and then, you know, now working with Indian Railways, NTPC, ESL, and lot many. We have tried to bring in new concepts in the building sector, in the building efficiency sector. So uh, that's where the genesis of energy positive as the next step, connecting it to the grid, really evolved around three to four years back. And that's where we are building on, and that's why this session. Uh, most of you are already aware of India's net zero commitments. Won't go into too much, but what is relevant for this particular session is India's net zero commitment 2070, which the Prime Minister himself has committed to as a country. Also increase our uh, targets for emission uh, redu intensity reduction by 45 percent uh, by 2030. India is well on its way, and that's why the targets were revised and enhanced. Uh, these two particularly are very relevant from the topic today that we have in hand, but also that 50% of our total capacity would come through clean energy or rather renewables. That's another, uh, you know, important uh, commitment that India has. The way we have approached this whole building sector from a net zero perspective is when we say net zero, different people and different organizations have different definitions of net zero. I remember in 2013, when we did the first international conference on net zero buildings, the concept or the word of net zero was unheard of in India. We did that in collaboration with Bureau of Energy Efficiency at that time. What it did was to establish a definition for net zero for India, because it means differently for different countries. And therefore, when we say net zero, we say, first look at your energy demand itself. How do you reduce it, minimize it? And this you could do through various measures, both on the policy regulatory side, uh, with you know building codes, energy conservation building codes, certification programs. So that's your policy regulatory drivers. But at the same time, incorporating it in the buildings through either the existing building through retrofit design, or retrofit uh, uh, you know appliances, or looking at from a generation perspective. Once your energy demand has been uh, you know, minimized, then from your generation perspective, uh, generate through renewable means, whether it's off-site, on-site, but on an annual basis, net zero would mean whatever the building has consumed is equal to the building's demand uh, generated. But the third and the second element that we have listed here is once that net zero status has been achieved, how do you make a building responsive to the grid? How do you connect it to the grid? And that's where the grid interactivity element comes in. Uh, I don't want to go through what all USAID has done in this sector. Maybe in the next slide we'll cover it. But we have been uh, you know, targeting all these three approaches to net zero, positive buildings, grid-connected buildings as a whole concept. 
So look, let's look at the re uh, reduction of the energy use per se. As I said, the first is that you should have the right policy regulatory drivers for efficient construction in the country. That is something uh, we're very proud to associate with Bureau of Energy Efficiency on that in supporting them to develop the first energy conservation building code in 2007 and then updating it in 2017, uh, you know, which was actually quite a, a advanced code in the sense that many countries actually even IEA recognized as one of the most progressive code. It set the standards for those build for the future directions as well. So in that you had the minimal compliance, you had the uh, next level of super efficient uh, buildings and then the near zero buildings as the third super ECBC what we call that. So that gave a signal to the market that even if the government doesn't make it mandatory, construction is 50 years, it's locked. So that's where the, you know, uh, the industry can move forward to. And then the other thing that we worked on was the net zero energy building certification with IGBC. In terms of uh, retrofits of the existing buildings, we have ESL senior representative here. Where we are very proud of our partnership with ESL that uh, spans more than a decade. And some of the, uh, you know, real tangible we were, did, uh, you know, on ground was this challenge of building retrofits, which was given to us by Government of India. I would say us means ESL, and we supported them. And the first 11,000 buildings, public buildings, were retrofit in a very short time frame of six to seven months through USAID's uh, program. And kudos to ESL for taking this large scale, and it continues till today. So this vertical of ESL continues to expand. The other new concept that we brought uh, when uh, the whole country and the world was under a lockdown stage in COVID, people confined to homes in curfews, we, uh, saw, we kind of brought this idea of how do we connect air conditioning with indoor air quality. That was the need of the hour at that time. When people will return to offices, they will have to face this issue. So that's where we call, brought the concept of healthy and energy efficient buildings. And not, not just brought the concept, we took it to ESL. They, as usual, were pioneer in picking up new concepts. They ran with it. And that's how we did the first couple of pilots on retrofitting of air conditioning to improve indoor air quality for safety and efficiency. And this was launched by the Honorable Minister for Power. And the first pilot was done in his room within the Ministry of Power, in Ministry of Home Affairs, and within ESL's premises, led to almost 98% improvement in the indoor air quality, still ongoing. The second thing that we, uh, 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 part of, again, the whole uh, net zero uh, movement, I would say, in the building sector was cooling. That's the major, that's the area from where the major demand uh, for energy comes in. We worked again both with ESL and also saw how sustainable public procurement becomes a part of the uh, government's procurement itself through GEMS, Government E-Marketplace. So we brought the first tranche of, or first, I would say even the jargon used uh, for uh, efficient ACs, uh, which are 30% more efficient than the existing five-star label, uh, the super efficient AC category. And we did that with ESL. We raised the bar of efficiency standard in those tender documents, which we supported, along with the rollout strategy. It, and that's how it kind of triggered the market to bring in more efficient products in the super efficient category in the AC manufacturing industry. We, what we also did was, with the GEMS, introduce the category of green energy efficient air conditioners within GEMS procurement system so that the public agencies in India start procuring. And, and we saw that within one six, uh, first six months of introducing the super, uh, super efficient green air conditioners on the GEMS platform, the sales of, uh, you know, actually bent towards green air conditioners and more than 12,000 units were sold in, I think, the first three, four months. My team is here to correct me. And that really uh, continues to escalate even as we speak. The third thing was uh, we continue to work with ESL on building more stringent efficiency uh, specifications within the tenders. Even as I speak, Abhishek is here, who is heading this whole appliance uh, business operations within ESL. And I don't know whether it's procurement sensitive, but the tender is about to close for the next tranche of super efficient ACs today, tomorrow, or maybe this end of this week. So hopefully that will again. And we are now moving to a national chillers program with ESL again. 
But fourth and very relevant from today's discussion is the super efficient smart ACs. So not just efficiency standard, but also making them star smart from the uh, aspect of demand response programs in future, that would be a next area we would be working in. Just to give you a couple of examples of net zero you know, campuses that exist in India, we are very proud of our association with Nalanda University. We have a senior representation from Nalanda whom you'll hear about in the next session. Net Zero Energy Campus, again, uh, uh, if I'm right, 445 acres, huge campus, Nalanda, and they were building their new university, and this is around in, I think, 2012, if I remember correctly. That's when we associated with them, set the vision of building from a usual building to a net zero campus, not from energy, but was water, uh, water and waste as well. And uh, Nalanda went on to do that. We still support them from a technical standpoint of view. What it did was that first it reduced its energy, not just through appliances, but basically the passive design and uh, the whole uh, material, embodied material that they use. Um, that is the first step in actually making it net zero, and they did that. And then the second was then this integrated low energy alternatives like DVAP system or thermal storage. And the third was uh, generating their power partially from renewables, which were on site solar PV and biogas generated with the uh, biomass that was available locally. So Nalanda stressed on the importance of available indigenous locally sourced materials. So it's a classic case of a huge campus which is already existing, about to be inaugurated. Uh, Manoj is here and he can tell you that. The next story I really want to speak about is Indian Railways. Again, one of the major power consumers in the country with already a, a net zero emission target by 2030, which was much earlier than when the country committed to net zero 2070. And again, very proud of our association. We have a MOU with Indian Railways, USAID has that, which was part of uh, both the government's leadership joint statement as well. And we work with them on all three aspects of net zero, energy efficiency. So we prepared a comprehensive energy efficiency policy with a time-bound action plan for the entire railway non-traction use. It's under implementation. The second was on the renewables part. We introduced the concept of round the clock, 100% renewable. Uh, two tenders have already been awarded, one of 900 megawatt, and yesterday, another one of 750 megawatt was also awarded by Indian Railways with our support, so we're very proud of our association there. We are, we've just initiated pilots in Baroda House, Northern Railway Zone, and also with Railway Board on highly energy efficient cooling systems and solutions to the whole idea is to pilot new cooling solutions and railway being a large scale adopter could scale it up throughout their you know, campuses or uh, facilities. And fourth is on e-mobility also. We are supporting the implementation of e-mobility policy that railway has, another aspect of net zero I would say. And integrating all this through an online monitoring and control system that we are supporting railways to develop. Uh, next slide, please. Next slide. Okay. And amongst all those demonstration pilots, real projects that we've supported, one thing we thought was very crucial is whenever we introduce something new, how do we socialize it with the people in general? And that's where the Net Zero Energy Buildings portal that we set up way back in 2014, if I remember correctly, uh, and it still is ongoing. It's a one-stop shop for all information, whether it's regarding to technologies that exist, the policies across the world on Net Zero, the regulations, the actual case studies, the demonstrations, the vendors that you need, the kind of materials that you need, all is there. There's also a Net Zero Alliance on that you could become members of. And so this is just, uh, you know, uh, one of the things that we did in terms of promoting Net Zero as a concept, and it's being taken to South Asia as well because our program operates across South Asia. Coming back to Grid Interactive, from Net Zero to now, the next step, Grid Interactive. If we look at Grid Interactive, they are highly energy efficient buildings connected to the grid. They meet the energy requirements through renewables, and there's a two-way communication between the building and the grid. 
That's the concept of the grid interactive net zero energy buildings. They have to be highly efficient. They have to be connected, smart in terms of their sensors or air controls or analytics, flexible and respond to the consumer needs and the utility needs and flexible. So they have, should have the ability to optimize their building operations as per the consumer need and as per the kind of distributed energy resources that are available to them. So that is uh, another thing uh, that we have done with National Smart Grid Mission. We have the pleasure of having the director of National Smart Grid Mission here who will talk uh, about this. This is the concept that we seeded a couple of years back. I'm very proud to say it has become mainstream as part of Ministry of Power Smart Grid 2030 roadmap now. It has also become part of a very, very recent, just last week's, and uh, I won't say it's even announced, but uh, smart distribution cities as a concept under the flagship distribution uh, reform scheme of Ministry of Power. The flexible buildings, net zero buildings are part of that uh, with actual sanctions from the Ministry of Power. So we move the needle from a concept to a roadmap to an actual budgetary allocation by the power ministry. And that's where I think we take a lot of pride in our association with the government of India. This is just a snapshot of that. And with NSGM, what we also did was, it was a new concept. We started this whole zero in dialogues, series of that on technology, policy, regulations, uh, behavior change. Uh, this we uh, will start, restart again. This was done in around 2018-19 or 20 rather. I'm forgetting my dates. But we are restarting and we would uh, encourage your participation in that. And that led to the development of the white paper on a grid interactive net zero energy buildings from an Indian perspective. It's available on our website. Um, and along with this, not just the promotion through zero in dialogues or mainstreaming it within Ministry of Power. Atulji, you missed the part where I mentioned you and your work. Uh, was also actually, they say, seeing is believing. So we worked on the first grid interactive net zero energy building of TS Redco in Hyderabad. It's under, so we, des I mean, we worked on the RFP for bringing in the grid interactive features as part of the design of it and we continue to support them in, in I mean, construction of this building, uh, even as we speak. So it's under construction. The other recent work that we are doing is, is on the building grid integration metrics for utilities with these two utilities. The whole idea is to develop, deliver, and then disseminate India-specific grid optimal metrics to facilitate building grid optimization. And this is what uh, a kind of a current work that we are doing. So this basically what we would do is be, uh, we will identify the uh, behind the meter time oriented energy efficiency and demand flexibility strategies uh, in the major building typologies and the grid context. So this is the ongoing work of USAID with these two utilities. Uh, and third approach, as we said, integrate and increase renewables again, an area of work where we have done a lot of work. We still continue to do through SAREP. And uh, like, for example, in railway buildings, uh, for distributed solar installation, we uh, supported the procurement. Uh, also, uh, with MNRE, we work very closely on um, solar rooftop uh, uh, renewables and also uh, through policy and regulatory support, both to MNRE and at the state level as well. So this is where I would like to end. But uh, we have a lot of expert panelists on the panel and really look forward to the deliberations today. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am, for the insightful presentation on grid interactive buildings. Now, I would request Mr. Atul Kumar Bali. He is an executive director at Power Grid Indi uh, to give special remarks. Welcome, you. Sir. Now, I would request Mr. Anand Kumar, chairperson. Delhi, Regulate, uh, Delhi Elect, uh, Real Estate Regulatory Authority Limited. Welcome, you, sir. Thank you, Bala. Uh, and uh, sorry uh, for uh, jumping the queue. And uh, because I have uh, another report meeting to attend, so I have to be there in time. I think this particular session 
and this debate on use of uh, on making net zero energy usage is very important is and very relevant and i congratulate mr vijay pillai and india smart grid forum for organizing this i have been in this field uh, for quite some time uh, i have been in infrastructure sector i have been in renewable energy power sector and now in the real estate sector <clears throat> now first thing is that are we creating awareness about the need of net zero are the are we making this as a public debate no we are still limiting net zero discussion within certain sessions conferences etc we have to make people aware that it is not only important to produce energy but it is always also important to conserve energy and if we conserve energy then the emissions would definitely come down and we would be able to achieve our target of 2030 of reducing our emissions of gdp by around 45% so the stress should be on conservation rather than production now this is about the awareness that we have to make it a mass movement and this is where agencies like india smart grid grid forum uh, becomes important when you are building this our new building for ministry of new and renewable energy we call the architect and we said that we have to set an example and this should be the net zero energy building we made the changes we changed changes we made the changes in the architectural design and ensured that it is it was in the net zero building and today it has come into being so we have led by example so similarly when we make a building whether our own house or our office building we must communicate a message that yes why net zero is important now how does it start i have to construct a building the first thing what we have to look into the directions of the building whether is north facing south facing west facing so if you have the larger area toward the south and west you will be able to capture the solar power and that will be more effective unfortunately we are not having the mini wind turbines agar aapko yaad hoga to you know in the initial in the, in the old houses there used to be uh, peacocks which used to move with the wind and they they could generate energy and, and in the west today mini wind uh, turbines are there and we should also do some more research and try to capture the wind energy so this is regarding that how do we capture the renewable energy for the benefit of the building so that is the direction is the first thing now when so this is the production part of the renewable energy and we connect it to the grid so when your production is there you can have uh, you can do the banking of energy you can uh, put the additional power, power generated into the grid and then whenever you require it you can draw it back next comes the design if you see the earlier design of our old homes they used to be light oriented you know wherever the light comes from there will be windows and there will be beach make there is the ahata you know what you call it the central court uh, uh, courtyard and that was precisely for the reason that there is no need for light so the lighting is the use uh, of the lighting should be minimal the, the artificial light and in the designs at the design stage itself we must ensure that there should be maximum use of the sunlight now having done the design what is the material we are going to use 
आज के दिन क्या होता है कोटा स्टोन लाना है इटालियन स्टोन लाना है ये स्टोन काटना है मार्बल काटना है बट वाई पीपल सेइंग दैट यस मार्बल इज देयर स्टोन इज देयर इट लुक गुड ऑल फाइन बट व्हाट अबाउट द एनर्जी व्हिच इज यूज्ड इन कटिंग द स्टोन्स कांट वी डू विद द टाइल्स वोन द हाउ वोन द हाउस लुक गुड इन द टाइल्स सो वाइल मेकिंग द बिल्डिंग ऑल्सो वी शुड कंजर्व एनर्जी and not only energy but also the water resources now if you see the marble polishing it takes so much of water so these small small things we must keep in mind that yes first the direction second the design then the whether then the items what you are using there now we have put we made the design we have got the right kind of material and the building is constructed the huge solar panels on the top of it but after that there will be a huge layer of dust on that and that net zero building would effectively be the positive uh, side of the thing so do we carry the regular audit of the net zero so we must also keep on carrying the net audit of the zero or net zero energy efficient buildings and how do we improve it whether we if we require additional energy can we use the parking slots if we require additional slots, uh, energy uh, can uh, do we require to replace uh, some of the solar panels with the more efficient solar panels or what is the latest technology which is coming in and similarly earlier we used to make the you know the huge 9 inches thick brick walls and it takes time but can it be used with any smart technology where which can make Buildings faster, so we all have to sit <coughs> and codify this. And once we codify these measures, then we must make all stakeholders aware of this. That look, your house will be as good, as beautiful as it is, but you can avoid this in the interest of larger interests of the society. If you ask me, I will adopt all those measures in the larger interests of society. But there will be somebody else. वो से नहीं नहीं मेरे को तो महल ही बनाना है हेल्प विद यू हु आर यू टू टेल मी है आई विल मेक द डिस्ट्रीब्यूशन कंपनी विल मोर रिचर बट वेन यू सी नाइन्टी नाइन परसेंट पीपल डूइंग दिस देन ही विल ऑल्सो कम इन लाइन वंस यू क्वालिफाई दिस देन वी मस्ट ग्रेड द बिल्डिंग्स ए ग्रेडिंग बी ग्रेडिंग सी ग्रेडिंग वी ऑल्सो मेक मेक ग्रेड द बिल्डर्स like dlf or unity or whosoever it may be that how much what kinds of building they are making and what kind of uh, you know how how energy efficient they are and how much uh, uh, you know they 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 are they are reducing the emission so once the builders of uh, you see the hotels the green hotels earlier nobody used to talk about the green hotels so now everybody talks about the green hotels people are started talking about the green buildings so we must do the codification and uh, then codification should be communicated and it should be implemented and it should be valued unless you give a value to this nothing will happen so we should uh, all together so do do this exercise and i think we should take this dialog uh, away from these conferences meet more often and uh, and bring in the newspapers make it on social media take suggestions of other people sometimes maybe we may have talked about 10 things but there may be 11th and 12th thing which is useful so which can come from any any public uh, source so this public uh, we have to make uh, energy conservation we have to make uh, net zero theme uh, as uh, as the moment of every person every a uh, person in this country so with these things i think i'll uh, stop here and uh, thank you very much the last thing which i would say is what reji had asked me to do about the digi dg sets and use of batteries and uh, storage haryana uh, has banned uh, use of dg sets and they have said that uh, all dg sets should be replaced by the batteries and uh, there are uh, some of the uh, battery manufacturers who are Uh, who are uh, bringing now uh, cost effective solutions uh, for use uh, and replacement of dg sets and also for lifts so i know some of the people but they are doing a good job 
and uh, right and have a good day with these words i'll stop here thank you very much uh, for listening to me i just put my some stray thoughts together and uh, we would welcome your suggestions as uh, real estate regulatory authority and in codification of measures which can uh, principles and measures which we communicate to the builders uh, for making the green buildings thank you thank you sir thank you for your insightful thoughts now i would request mr atul kumar bali to hand over the token of appreciation to anand kumar sir one minute Thank you, sir. Now I would request Mr. Atul Kumar Bali to give special remarks. Welcome, sir. Dhanyavad Balaji, Namaskar. And uh, I think uh, it's the right time. And as uh, where the Mr. Anand Kumar left, I would just mention one is basically a greenfield project and one, uh, one is the existing project. That we have to just make a change in that. Because he was mentioning Haryana, I am from Gurgaon, and uh, incidentally, I am a general secretary of a society also, a large society. And they have, they have given a regulation of changing existing DG set to the CNG DG sets and all that. And even though there is no pipeline of SCG gas and all that, then they given a timeline, I remember, it was 30th September. And that was the entire burden to the group housing societies and all that. And there were so many emergency loads going through of the lifts all together in the DG set, changing all together, that will be a very huge economical burden, not only economical burden, technological burden also to engage all together. Of course, we have to look forward. It has to be a mix of that. If it's a green field, that's a very good idea. And I think as uh, Mr. Reji at the very beginning told of our DCAS and all that, if we're going ahead with that type of uh, analogy or of diff that type of approach, that is a very suited concept. and. Uh, I was going through when we have a zero net energy dialogues uh, with the USAID and SARIPT and of course Mr. Thagat and Nidhi. We have had discussions along with the foreign collaborators and all that. In Indian context, we have to look forward in that respect how to go further. In that respect, if there are new things and everything, we can very well have the design code. We can build on that and they are building on that. And a large transformation in building sector is coming. There we can very well take steps. Haryana has gone ahead with that. They have said, this particular acreage of, uh, let's say, campuses of the building, they have to mandatory have to have the rooftop solar and everything. And similarly, in other aspects, we can issue guidelines that will be easy to adhere with. But with the existing one, we have to slowly shift over, change over slowly, as we have done with the, let's say, the LPG. We have given the HPG and SCG gas and all that. That besides the point, ultimately, is the concept. Concept one is a technology, and other thing is how to imbibe that slowly and gradually so that it can usher in a very good environment later on. Coming down to this net zero energy efficient building, and as the topic is, I think, very rightly stated, positive energy, the, I think the topic was uh, nearly the energy positive buildings and smart buildings. One thing is very good, and we already know that ECBS compliant, there's a norms given to that, they have to adhere to these norms, that is okay, fair enough. Another thing is to make these buildings smart, response, because they should be response ready, ready to add, rather interact with the grid as such. When we talk of the grid interactive building, then first thing is we need to identify the loads, the load which are critical and load which are non-critical. For that, we need to have to have the detailed study and coming out of the detailed study, then we'll be having the grid optical optimal matrix. That is what we are trying to work out with the NBA and other things along with the USA team altogether. And we have been working with, as been told, with Haryana, one with the DHVP and another is the Indoor. The utility, we have taken forward a concept. And there we have to arrive at what are the basically options available to them so that on the real ground we can touch base. And that is a slowly going to evolve. And maybe I think a year or so, maybe during the discussion, we will be having a where we have forwarded because first is to get the data and then we have to have certain pilot based analysis and of course developing that matrix and deploying them so that actually we can see that light of there whether that good uh, interactive 
net zero building that concept we are going to implement and how that can be taken forward. If we go through the, at the moment, the net zero building concept as such, we have seen that. I would not name the cities and the building, major buildings. It can be an airport, can be other building, very good building. So much advertisement, everything that it is 100% net zero building. But what we see in the day, daytime solar is being generated and the nighttime they're taking it from the grid. That is not the net zero energy efficient building. In daytime you're generating, then of course in the peak time you also have to have the storage and other thing also so that it is in a standalone mode also it can suffice your requirements. And for that we have to work out the solution. Otherwise, it will be totally load on the utility to give back to the building and that will be a real stress time. So, uh, what I think the net zero energy efficient building and the grip optical metrics and other thing what we are talking about smart, then we look at the concept how the demand response would work, how the peak can be shaped. We are going to have I think with certain city two time peak, multiple time peaks and as the AC was rightly touched upon in Delhi and of course we are sitting right at the edge because of certain, I think, weather storm and other changes, we have extended little bit winter up to the March, whole is, I think, delayed by month end. But after that, we have to have the sea changes. There will be too much of heat generating out of that, and we have to bear that. For that, the AC load is the critical, and that is increasing day by day. For that to meet, we'll be having our multiple peaks in the city itself, and we have to have that idea how to manage that, how to DR will be working about that. And of course, the other load which is coming, we have to take care of that is that EV load and other things. We are going in a big way to have the 30%, 30 by 2030. Keeping that in mind, we have to design building. We have to have the metrics. We have to have the parameters altogether, make it smart. And there would, it would come the technological intervention. Smart meter is one aspect to get the data and everything. Other things is how to make it interactive and how to make it like Sometimes the virtual plants like that, how to feed that. Because DG, many utilities have already bought. But what to do with that? Can then be made into the virtual power plant? Can then be made to, because we have to have a moderation in the sense. We cannot just shift over altogether in a day. Keeping that in mind, I think is the right time. We can dwell upon, we can moderate, we can study, we can give the solution in time. And certain buildings we have to identify, uh, as I think Nalanda is a green building altogether. Telanga, they have built, a, I think, a very new complex smart building, but other things are also coming into way. And from that beginning, I think if we move together, then I think uh, we are ushering in an era where this net zero grid interactive building would be seeing the light of the day. And nothing to add, I'll be waiting for the interaction, the insight, what the, over the time we have achieved that. And um, that is way to go ahead. And uh, thank you for the, this opportunity given to me. I look forward to the discussion. Thank you. Thank you, sir, for insightful special remarks on energy buildings. Now, I would request Mr. Sumed Agarwal, Jaina Zandi Dias, to ha hand over the token of appreciation to Mr. At Atul Kumar Bali. Thank you, sir.